First Peter chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, reading. For then, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to that same excess of rioting, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us all turn to God in prayer. Eternal God, our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you for journey mercies to thy house. We thank you for enabling us, O Lord, to come, for we know that it is thy mercies and thy grace alone that we are found here. And Lord, even as we come, we do seek again for the fresh cleansing, washing, and purging of all our sins in the blood of our Saviour. Father, we pray again that you would remove all distraction of thoughts, tiredness of the body, the cares of the world, and focus our hearts and mind upon thy word. Lord, we need thy word to help us live this life on earth. But Lord, we know that the body and the mind is limited. We ask for thy Holy Spirit to help us through this session. We ask for help upon the facilitators, grant to them wisdom from above, anoint their lips likewise. O Lord, feed thy children in thy house tonight. Strengthen thy church as thy people learn to live according to your word. This we ask and we pray for the sake of the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Now remember, Peter has been dealing with the Christians suffering in this world. They are, these Christians in Peter's time, they were severely under great persecution by the Emperor Nero. Persecution beyond our imaginations. He dealt with then the Christian in undergoing this persecution to remember we are just strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Reminding us of that for two reasons. Number one, because when we remember that, it helps us to go through our persecution, to endure all things. Reminding us because our testimony in this world as strangers and pilgrims depend on our response, our responses to the world. So we have studied in chapter 3 our responses to the government, our responses to our bosses, the, our, our responses to um, our family members, response to one another, um, response to God himself in obedience. Submission was the key. Now the apostle Peter is used of God to deal with not the external issues, how we live in the eyes of the government, our bosses, our family, but now he deals with how we live with one another. How we live with one another. Look at verse 8. We covered verse 7 last time. Now we look at verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Now this is crucial because whether Christianity would survive during that time when the Romans, including the Jews themselves, would want to wipe out, wipe out the Christians, wipe out this new religion to them. God knows that this external persecution that they were facing would not be the thing that would crush Christianity. It would not. In fact, 
The harder Satan tried through persecutions, the stronger, the more united, the more committed, the more loyal Christians became to Christ. Here, Peter dealt with what could cause Christian, Christians to fight among themselves and therefore fall and therefore fail as strangers and pilgrims and therefore bring Christianity down. What is that? Verse 8. When there is no fervent charity, Christians will begin to take on one, one another. They will begin to attack one another instead of help one another. Internal strife within Christianity is what will demolish Christianity. So here Peter now brings up yet another item. After talking about how when the world mocks you, reviled you, reminding them that don't you worry, let God be your judge. In verse 6, just worry about God, what God thinks of you. But now you have to worry about what you think of one another. If you're not careful, you will crush one another. Now, so we begin to ask ourselves question number one. What does charity, what does charity covering a multitude of sins mean? What does it mean? It's a very common phrase that people use. Now, what do you think it means? I'm curious to know. Maybe Shane, what does charity covers a multitude of sins mean in your mind? Say again. Personal sins against one another. What about it? What about it? But what does it mean to cover charity covereth covers the multitude of sins? Oh, I see. So in fighting personal offenses against one another to be forgiving about those. That's why I mean charity covereth a multitude of sins. Mm, okay. Maybe I ask Ben, what do you think? Be willing to forgive and to cover personal sins and not to expose people who sin against you. All right, but the clarification is, but when it comes to sins that are doctrinal, theology, um, and, or civil matters, that is not for us to cover. Okay, maybe last one, um, Susan. I guess it includes not holding grudges. Yes, very good. Those are the things that that are required of us. But let's then go into more details, all right, to expand and expound on some of this. I think someone just came in, may need, Mark may need the question sheet, uh, Deacon Eugene, can you help? All right, so, now, love covers charity, or rather charity. Now, the word charity instead is translated instead of Love is obvious. We always know charity emphasizes on actions, all right? Love, more the emotion, the attitude. But charity brings out the nuance, the emphasis of actions, all right? Actions. So certain actions of love covers a multitude of sin. Number one. Now, first and foremost, is it just simply, well, they sin against me, then I forgive and I don't do anything about it. Because most of you brought it up. It is to forgive and then not, and not to uh, make a fuss out of it and to you know, broadcast it. But is that really 
and only what it means. What do you think? Do you think it means just that, Thomas? <laughs> okay, he has deeper... The fact that I asked... The fact that I asked a further question, you know that it has a deeper meaning than that. All right, Mr. Wiseman, can you enlighten us on the deeper meaning that you're thinking of? <laughs> Okay, so responding in love, when someone commits an offense against you personally, then it will cause the person not to sin against you anymore. If the person feels very bad, isn't it? Okay, let me ask you this. All right, Julius. All right, Julius sinned against you by slapping you. All right? So, by what is discussed so far, love covers a multitude of sin, charity covers a multitude of sin, means, well, then um, forgive. And then uh, don't, don't broadcast it and don't talk about it. Does it sound sensible? Biblical at least. If your son slapped you, exercise my authority as a father, but if it's uh, my brother, then I turn the other cheek. How would you exercise your authority as a father? Very good. If I don't teach him that slapping your father and anyone for that matter is wrong, then he will never learn. All right? So we have to be clear about this because sometimes we think love covers a multitude of sin means, yes, be forgiving. Yes, um, don't make it a big matter. Yes, don't talk about it. And that is all. Then what about the case of, like I just mentioned, the child slapping a father? Now, turn with me to James chapter 5, verse 19. James chapter 5, verse 19. Here we see um, a ex more expounded um, statement to help us understand what, what the Bible means by hiding a multitude of sins, all right? James chapter 5, verse 9. So we use scriptures to interpret scriptures to help us to be clear about scriptures, all right? James 5.19. Let's read James 5.19 together. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. So first and foremost, when the Bible says an action that will hide a multitude of sin. It begins with conversion, conversion, the changing of a person, all right? The changing of a person, even for Christian. Now, conversion, of course, in salvation, for example, when you share the gospel and someone gets saved, you truly are instrumental in covering, uh, hiding a multitude of sins, right? Because the person comes to Christ, seeks for forgiveness, as a result, his life of sin, his whole life of sin and his future sins are all covered. You are not the one, all right, who covers sin. It is the blood of Christ. And even for the Christian, when, when the Apostle Peter fell, the Lord says, when you are converted, when you are converted, is, is God saying that Peter was not a believer then? But he said, when you are converted, he said, when, you're, when you change, when you re repent, when you understand and you change, then go and help your brethren too, which he did. All right? So when you cause someone to change, it is not simply just forgiving. Yes, that is the second part. But there must be the person coming to an understanding that what he did was wrong, then 
turn to Christ for forgiveness in repentance, then there is a covering of sin. Please remember that. So it's not simply you cover sin by not talking about it, not broadcasting it. That is not what the Bible means when it says, shall hide a multitude of sins. All right? First and foremost, his sins must be covered in the blood of Christ. Then such covering is of any meaning. God cannot possibly be just saying that now you cover sins and that is good enough, right? Because God's intention is always that our sins are covered under the blood of Christ because of our repentance. And therefore you, when you are involved to help someone, that must be your aim as well. All right, so that's the first thing we must remember. When you, so covering a multitude of sin, now it begins with you convincing the person whether there's a point of error in doctrine or whether there's a point of error in their living, their duty as a Christian. Then cause them to see their evil ways. Cause them to have true repentance. And they turn to Christ for, for forgiveness, in the case of unbelief, for salvation. Then his sins are covered in the blood of Christ. So it begins with that. That is why Thomas said, right? Yeah, I... Yes, I may, be, I may be forgiving to my child, but I cannot ignore this sin. I must teach him. I must help him. Otherwise, he remains having this sin in his life. And worse, he will commit further sins, right? So the sin covered is he repents and it doesn't happen again and therefore is covered, all right? So that is the first thing we must remember from scriptures, from James 5.19, a more detailed explanation. You, if any man, if any of you, right, if any of you means believers, if any of you err from the truth, whether in doctrine or in duty, and one convert him, and one convert him, all right? So that. Now, then it also means what you said. Now, that as, as an important part of covering sin, now it also then means you would, you would be someone who's, who rather that others do not know. You would rather that others do not know about the sin, about this person's sin. Charity, fervent charity among yourselves, for charity cover the multitude of sins. Means he's telling the Christians, you must not be people who love to let others know the sins of others, whether it's personal or, 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 or not personal. You must be people who prefer that, you know, people have not evil, dishonorable thoughts of others. Unless it is absolutely necessary. All right? So also don't get the understanding that we must never talk about anyone's sin at all in any situation, any kind of sin. Because in scriptures, why do you think God says, if a brother sin against you, all right, and refuses to deal with it, then you go to another brethren, right? It doesn't contradict scriptures, doesn't contradict scriptures. There are occasions where you may need to in involve others, but it must be absolutely necessary, number one. Number two, for biblical reasons, all right? When there are biblical reasons, when an elder sin, a certain, certain sins which must be publicly made known, we also are taught in scriptures, rebuke before all, all right? You cannot say, oh, the Bible says cover, cover up, all right? The pastor commits adultery, the elder or the deacon steal money from the church, and I say, let's cover up. Let's cover up. All right, so unless absolutely necessary for biblical reasons, and if it is necessary, it must be done in a biblical way. There are biblical um, steps to follow. So you're not someone who, wow, when something happens, you just want to jump on it to go and start telling people and think 
and rationalize and give excuses that this person must know, that person must know, everybody must know. Now, that is the weakness of our heart. We can come up with a lot of reasons why people need to know. Now, rather not, you would, your natural reaction is, I'd rather people do not know. I need to, I want to, th my natural reaction is not to let people know, but to think very carefully why if I need to deal with this publicly, or more people must know. All right? The other one, what it means is, your aim is never to ruin someone. You, you have no desire to ruin someone. Love, charity, covers the multitude of sins. Your aim is to cover not to ruin, is to cover the person, not to ruin the person. Not to expose the person, to shame the person. All right, and your aims is also not only not to embarrass, not to attack, not to broadcast. Your aim is always not to have other have a bad opinion. Of others. Now you may need to deal with some things, but still your aim is not so that people will have a bad opinion of someone. It's to deal with the issues, help the person repent. The aim of helping a person to repent, when Christ wanted Peter to repent, to be converted, to, to, to change. Christ's aim was not to embarrass him. Christ wanted to continue to use him as an apostle after his resurrection. That was always his aim. It's not to read the, all the rest of the apostles say, yeah, Peter, you talk so much, you big mouth, now you're like that. Nah, now you know who you are. Christ was never like that. Not to, give, not to make them have an evil opinion of Peter. All right? So that is what it means to cover. And... Importantly also, to cover a multitude of sins, it is not to bring up, not to bring up things, past sins of people before they were saved. Past sins of people when they were backslided or when they were ignorant that it was a sin and they have repented of it. All right? Now, I remember when I first came, my very first trip to this church, there were certain people, and I thank God they're no longer in this church. Within my first few days, they gave me a rundown of many of your history. A rundown of your history to the point of before you were saved. When they kept bringing up, I said, why are you telling me these things? Then I asked, did they do these things when they were Christians? Oh, no, 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 no. They were not safe at that time. Or some when they were backslided and they fell into certain grievous sins. And the person have repented, paid for the sins. But it was brought up like it was such a, such a um, present thing and is, is unresolved and it is, this is who the person is. You see, that is what it means when God says, charity covereth, shall cover the multitude of sins. But hatred will not. This kind of heart will not. It is the past. And in some cases, it is because of ignorance. The Christian did not know these things were sin. Did them because the whole world does them. So please remember, do not, do not harbour this kind of attitude, right? You must be someone who take no pleasure. You must be someone who is grieved if ever you need to talk about someone else's sin. When there is an absolute necessity and even when done biblically, it should be that. That was what these Christians needed. It's easy for them eh, to say, hey, you know that family, their children denied Christ. You know, the other family 
were under persecution. No, we, we stood so strong. But those family, they compromised. Peter probably understood. In fact, I would say probably Peter of all the persons would understand most clearly what it means to fall. He fell most publicly, most grievously. Everyone knew it. Christ talked about it. He felt so grievously that he, when he made such strong statements and, and, and a commitment of promises that he will not deny Christ, but yet he did. Peter, of all the persons, understands what it is to be on the other side. And he understood what Christ's heart and aim was restoration when he dealt with it when he dealt with him now he teaches from experience he learned never himself to be so cocky again to feel that way about others remember what he said though all though all desert you i will not now he understood there are times when people feel certain things even good people, they can fall. There's no need for us to rejoice in their fall. All right? Now, it also means this. Now, when I mention, sometimes they are about their sins are not against you. Right? So please don't think these are just sins against you because most of you just brought up sins against you, sins against you. Yes, definitely. Sins against you, ready to forgive and so on. We'll talk more about that. But even if there were not sins against you, all right, your sins that they committed, not against you, but sins that they committed in their life, you must also be always ready, all right, to cover a multitude. Means to convert the person and to not want others to know unnecessarily. Now, but I just want to clarify, there are some things that people may need to know, all right? I say again, need to know because of the protection of individuals or the church. But even if you are involved in the need to know, listen carefully, I hope you understand what I'm saying. Even if you are among the need to know, you must apply the same principle. You must apply this, that I must have charity to cover the multitude of sins. You must know that I must not be, wow, a rumor, gossip, um, consumer, and love it. And then take evil thoughts against the person from then on. If the person has repented, the person has shown fruits of repentance, you need to know to deal with certain things, then that is all, all right? It's covered. Deal with the person, with Christian love. Now, next one. Now, sometimes, yes, when it is personal, love or charity covereth a multitude of sins. Now, it means this. You don't take offense easily. You don't take offense easily. What do I mean? Now, especially when no offense is intended. You know, when you have a good friend, all right? Close friend, and, and you have only good thoughts of the person, your clothes, your buddies, and, well, you know, you, you can tolerate each other. We tend to be like that. We don't take offense easily because there's, there is charity, all right? But when it is, we sh rather, we should be like that with everyone, with everyone. When we are not like that, we tend to take offense easily. Someone says something. It's meant to be a joke. Or sometimes people are not so um, refined or refi socially refined, all right? They may say certain things certain ways or in their culture or from their country, 
They tend to say things like that. Don't take offense, all right? Don't be so quick to take offense. You know, when I was working, um, when I started to work in a regional level and I had to take over Australia to look after Australia, I came here, I, came to, I went to Sydney for a business trip once. And my first meeting there with some of the people who work for me and I have never met them, you know, at dinner, I, I was like, I was jabbed, you know. I was just made a laughing stock the whole time. And I felt as this is quite offensive. Now, at the end of it, at least this is what they told me. One of them said, you know, when we are like that with you, means we treat you as one of us. Means... You know, we are comfortable with you and we make fun of one another. That's how we are as Australians. I say, okay, that's comforting to know. But I was thinking, now, if, if I took offence easily, it's their culture. And they keep emphasising, we only make fun and we are so close with people that we trust and we, we think we are, we are buddies. If not, we will be very formal with you. And if we are very formal with you and we only say nice things about you, you should be worried. It means you know, we don't quite like you and we just want you to go away quickly. Now, that is what it is. You see, when, when we jump to conclusions, that's how we are. We take offence and then we hold that, that offence in our heart in church against someone else. Now, have you had someone say something to you and until today, you used to say, you know, that person said this to me, you know. And you're still holding it in your heart. Well, this is a verse for you. Charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Even it was... Now, so don't take offence where no offence is intended. Don't always think that, there is of, that the person intends to offend you. When you have charity, you won't think like that. It's a good practice. Now, the other is when there is offence intended. When there is indeed offence intended then deal with it biblically, charitably, lovingly, compassionately, with a forgiving spirit. All right? This is what it means. Charity shall cover. That is what charity will do. Now, but even in dealing with it, in offences that, that were intended, that were intended to be rude, intended to hurt you. Even when we deal with it lovingly, charitably, with forgiveness, the difference is, maybe I will ask you, what's the difference? Why did not God say, forgive those who offend you? But God would repeatedly in Scripture say, Charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Rather, why would not God say, just forgive those who sin against you? Why would God say, charity shall cover the multitude of sins? Do you understand my question? Ernest, do you understand my question? Why don't God just simply say, forgive those who offend you? But God says, charity shall cover a multitude of sins. So it's just forgiving, I just forgive you. I deal with, uh, you offend me and you intend to offend me, I forgive you. Isn't that good enough? Why? No. So why do you think God would say, so what other spirit is, is needed besides just when you're dealing with an intended offence, just simply forgive. What other spirit is needed? What other aim is needed, Ernest? A loving spirit. Loving specifically to do what? Very good. Very good. So it is not just forgive. That is why God says, charity shall cover the multitude of sin. There is a covering that you're aiming for. You're aiming for restoration. All right? You're not just aiming for forgiveness. Remember that. There is a difference between forgive and cover. 
a multitude of sin. You see, James 5.19 helps us to understand this. If any one of you do err from the truth, for example, this person err from the truth, speaks rudely against you and attack you, malign you, um, insult you, wrong uh, for no reason earth from the truth and if you forgive him no the bible says and you convert him then he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall hide a multitude of sins only forgiving itself does not cover a multitude of sin converting is what covers a multitude of sin so even when you forgive you must aim or rather, I would put it this way. There is always this concern in your heart about the person in God's eye. You're not just concerned about, well, I, I forgive him, then I just yeah, I forget about it. You're still worried. But what about his standing in God's eye? Until he deals with that, he acknowledges that was wrong, and repents from it, I'm worried that his sins are still accountable and he, there will still be consequences. I'm more concerned about that. All right? So when your son slapped you on your face, forgiving alone, you know, you know it's not good enough, right? You say, I must change him. What is your aim? Change him so that, so that well, so that uh, he don't do it to mommy and mommy won't feel the pain. No, you're concerned about what kind of Christian he will be, right? That's what you're concerned about. What kind of Christian he will be if I do not convert him? So, love covers a multitude. Love, charity shall cover a multitude of sin. When someone offends you, it is not, well, I, I ignore it, I'm forgiving. But when you are dealing with things, you're constantly, you have a very clear concern and aim to restore that person not just restore your fellowship but to restore the person in his fellowship with God now if you're not if you are not several things will follow number one the next time something happens Something similar happens between you and the person. Now you can easily jump on. You can, you can easily want to find reasons now. Say, okay, now this is it. I, 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 I need to deal with you harshly. Because if you're very concerned about the person's relationship with God, you will be very patient. You will be very long-suffering. You will constantly still be willing to deal with the person in that spirit. It will be like that. So love, charity shall cover a multitude of sin. God did not use the word love. He said charity. It's this action that keeps going on and on, that you're willing to do again and again. You're only willing to do that again and again if you're concerned about His fellowship with God. And you'll be able to take a lot you will be able to take a lot from the person. All right? So, don't take this just simply, ah, be forgiving and forget it. That's it. It will lead to errors, lead to not correcting, and lead to just doing it, but without an intention of helping the person. Now, then it also means, well, you have mentioned, not holding grudges. All right? Not holding grudges. You must understand your salvation first and foremost. Your salvation is this. You sin against God. God chose to forgive you. But God did not just say, I forgive you. And that's it. Jesus Christ, and I've taught you, taught you this theology in BBK. Jesus Christ, to forgive you, he must take the hit. Remember? To forgive you, Jesus Christ must suffer for 
the sin. Someone who does something against you, you can only forgive if you say, I forgive you for, for not paying back a million dollars. What does it mean? It means that I will suffer the loss. So when Jesus Christ forgive you, he will take the hit. He will suffer loss. And after that, did he hold a grudge against you, against me? Always saying this to you. You know, because of you, I went to the cross. Because of you, I was stripped naked and suffered embarrassment. Because of you, I was beaten to death, not even to half death, to death. Because of you, I left heaven and walked on this sin-filled world. Because of you, I was maligned. Did Christ ever keep saying that to you and I? In order that you get forgiven. Forgive means you will not hold a grudge. For Christ to cover your and my infinite multitude of sins, Christ had to take the hit and Christ never held any grudges against us. He continued to be patient, kind, long-suffering, understanding. So understand when it means charity shall cover the multitude of sins, it means after you have taken the hit, you do not keep talking about it and hold a grudge. Until you and I understand our salvation theologically and the theology hits our heart, then we will understand this verse, experience this verse, and live this verse. I would say that there is nothing that anyone on earth could do to us that we have done to Christ. But yet Christ never held a grudge against us. Forgiven, covered in His blood, never brought up again in eternity. So when you say, I want to be someone who exercises charity to cover a multitude of sins, you must keep remembering. Every time the grudge comes up, Christ never held a grudge after he took the hit. I must learn that when he came to cover my multitude of sins. Now another thing, love covers a multitude of sins would mean not nitpicking. Not nitpicking. You can always find sin in someone. You can always, unless it's Christ. And even for Christ, people try to find sin in him. That is our nature. Our nature is to find sin in someone, find fault. Because of our critical spirit, our nature is we have like opportunities to talk about someone else because our nature is boastful. We like to feel holier than others. And we talk about someone else's sin, it appears like we are holier than the person, right? Charity shall cover the multitude of sin is an attitude of not seeking to uncover, spread sin by finding out wanting to know. There are people who love to know things. Pastor, what happened to this? Person? What, what happened there? What happened this? I'm a pastor. I don't, need, I don't have a choice. I need to know. But if I'm not a pastor, frankly, I'd rather not know. Because the more I know, number one, the more I know I'm open to the Satan's, uh, Satan's attack of casting evil thoughts. Number two, the more we know, the more you realize that you're now having the responsibility to help. I'd rather not know. But there are people who love to know because that is in our nature, to nitpick, to find fault, to talk about it. Rather than cover, cover. Let as little, as few people know as possible. All right? So don't, don't keep finding fault. Now, but I want to emphasize, not all offenses, not all offenses are to be covered. All right? If someone molested you, that is a civil matter. Don't say, well, cover a multitude of sin, don't talk about it. It must be re reported, right? So please know the difference. Also, now some sins 
they are harmful to others, they are dishonoring to God. They must be dealt with. All right? We are not talking about these kind of things. I hope you understand. Some sins need to be exposed. The Apostle Paul exposed sins explicitly. He named names explicitly. All right? So we must know the difference. But here we are talking about well, personal sins, sins that are not needed to be dealt with in that way, but we like to go finding, go around finding it. You know, there is someone who, who wrote, and I think it makes a lot, it's a very nice, it's a very appropriate picture. Say people who do not have charity that cover a multitude of sin are like flies. You know, house flies? House flies. They fly around and they will bypass all the healthy and nice parts of a person's body. What do they land and look, after, look for? The sores, the wounds, right? They only look for those. Everything else they are blind to, they are not interested in. And then they land on it to irritate it. I thought that was a very good picture. Every time we have that tendency, remind ourselves of that picture. Am I being a fly? There are so many good things about the person, so many laudable things about the person, so many commendable th things about the person, but I seem to only keep seeing those sinful parts. Am I like a fly? That is what it means. Love shall cover a multitude of sin. Now, finally, it also means this. Is it finally? Finally, it also means this. Love covers, charity shall cover the multitude of sin. The charity part, the action part, will be done with a lot of patience and compassion and long-suffering. All right? Now, in fact, you want to know more about love, you know you go to 1 Corinthians 13, right? 1 Corinthians 13, and it says, Charity suffereth long, is kind, is very patient. You love your child. You would, I think you will, you, you will readily admit you're more patient with your child than, than with someone else who irritates you. Maybe <laughs> yeah, oh, it's true. People that you love, you tend to be more patient. You tend to overlook many things. You know, even when people are in courtship, people say love is blind, right? Love is blind. Why do they say that? Because everyone else can see the problem with the guy or the girl, but you can't see because you're blinded, all right? In that sense, all right? I'm not saying it's good or right, but what I'm saying is when there is love, when there is charity, you are patient, you are long-suffering. You tolerate. You're more tolerating to handle things, all right? Now, even if you need to deal with things, you're, you're more, like the Bible says, Charity suffereth long. Right? Charity rejoices not in iniquity. You're, you don't, you're, not happy. you're not rejoicing to go and spread something when there is sin. You do not rejoice in iniquity that is committed. Charity is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil, right? You're, you, don't, you don't always think that the person is saying to offend me again. This person is trying to irritate me again. Because there is charity, you do not think like that. You do not respond like that. All right? Now, what does it not mean? Question number two. Just very quickly, all right? I've said some things already. Now, parents, please don't quote this to ignore any sinful behavior of your child. When someone in church, some Sunday school teacher, or when the pastor say, hey, I think you better deal with your child in this area. It's getting out of hand. It's not good for the child. Please don't say, Pastor, you taught us. Par charity covers the multitude of sins. So just ignore it. All right? Certain things, we, we never, or rather, I put it say, we reaffirm. Biblical meaning of charity shall cover a multitude of sin. In the Bible is, he that converteth a sinner from his, the errors of his way. All right? Number two, what does it not mean? It does not mean that we ignore and do not deal with sin. We said that already, but I just want to be very clear. Because one day, if you have to deal with any sin in church, 
have to exercise church discipline. Please don't quote this verse. All right? Unless we are exercising it wrongly, for the wrong reasons, unnecessarily. All right? You know the five steps of church discipline. When leaders commit certain sins, we are not to say, well, you know, let's cover it up. Let's not embarrass the church. Neither must you, when a brother or a sister or the church try to convert you, change you, say, you must not mention my sin because charity covers the multitude of sins. So please, you must not mention my sin. It does not mean not talking to the person about their sin because that is self-love. You know why I say that? Many people feel that charity covers the multitude of sins, so I don't deal with it. The reality is they don't want the person to dislike them. Very often parents are like that. All right? Hey, daddy, go and talk to your child. No, la, mommy, you talk to the child. Right? Why? Because you don't want to be the bad person. It's self-love in the, at the end of the day. True love always promotes sanctification, deals with sin with compassion, desires not that people need to people know. All right, number three. Question number three. All right, I'm actually very behind time. Question number three. Now, what must we remember when others fall into sin? What must we remember? Number one. When you struggle with this charity thing, remember that there are immature Christians. There are Christians that are still going through progressive sanctification. Remember that there are some Christians that are misguided. Remember there are some Christians that are in a backslided stage. Remember that even the most mature Christians can make mistakes and are also just sinners. And remember, therefore, in all that, to exercise charity, to continue to be courteous. Now, in fact, Peter did allude to this early on. If you turn to chapter 3, chapter 3. All right, verse 8. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love, same word. But here as love, as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, be pitiful. Understand that some of them are immature. Understand that some are struggling in a backslided stage. Be pitiful, be courteous, continue to be gracious in your behavior towards them. When someone falls into sin, we are not saying to ignore and don't deal with it and just say, ah, they're just growing up still, ah, my child, ah, just ignore it. We are not saying that. All right? So parents don't misunderstand. We are not promoting parenting that say they are growing up. They are going through a phase. Just ignore it. They'll get over that phase. That is wrong parenting. All right? Don't say, are they immature Christians? Are ah, they backslided? So just ignore it. All right? We are not saying that. But we are saying when dealing and helping, when converting, continue to be pitiful, be courteous. Remember that they are just sinners. I told you this story before, right? This person went to Israel, I think, to watch the shepherds to learn about shepherding and to learn about sheep because he keep reading in the Bible. And then this sheep, the same sheep, keeps running off keeps getting itself injured. And then the, the, the shepherd has to keep going after it, risk his life a few times around cliffs and all that, bring it back again, and then it does the same thing again and again. And then this man who was observing asked the shepherd, why, do you, why are you so patient? Why, why, why do you keep doing it? And the shepherd looked very puzzled. 
at the man and said, it's just a sheep. It's just a sheep. Sheep are like that. That's a lesson to learn. We are all sheep, you and I included. Even when you are trying to help the person, you are also not excluded from being like the person. All right? So continue to be pitiful. Is they are sheep. I am a sheep too. All right? So be genuine. When someone has fallen, be genuine. All right? Don't say, a pastor say, you know, um, could, charity covers the multitude of sin means, it means conversion. So, I must find out, I must come and help you. Yes, please be so, but be genuine. All right? There are many who want to do that in churches, but it's actually, they love a good, juicy story. All right? So, be genuine. When someone has fallen and you're to help, be genuine. Next one is, not every slip up, not every fall must be called to attention when someone falls. All right? We are neither are we saying. Well, charity is about, well, covering multitude of sin is about converting. So, I must be a policeman in church to help my brethren. Find out everything about everyone and do everything in every case, to deal with everything in every case. All right? We are not saying that. Be like I say, don't try to demand every ounce of justice when someone falls, when someone offends you. Now, on Sunday, I just mentioned about Joseph and Mary when we talk about abortion. Mary, of all the person, would be the one that said, please, can I abort, right? Because the, in our culture, especially in my sister, I can be stoned to death, you know? So can I please abort? But then I thought of Joseph when I was preparing this message. What did Joseph do? Joseph must have felt very offended. Joseph must have felt very betrayed. Joseph must have felt very embarrassed. Joseph, of all the person, to save his own face and to and to um, get every ounce of justice for himself, had the right to expose Mary. Now, you remember all this before the angels informed Joseph of what it all was, right? Until then, he had every right opportunity to exercise every ounce of justice due to him. But what did, he, what did the Bible say? He decided to put away Mary. What's the word? Anyone remember? Privily. Not publicly. He, for all the person, had the right to do that. Could do that. No one would blame him. But that was him. That was him. When there's offense against us, think of Joseph. Before he received the information about who the child was, he could have done all that, but his decision even before he received the information from the angel was to put her away privately, right? Whatever we have people sin against us cannot be compared, I've said early on, compared to what we have sinned against Christ and continue to do so against Christ after salvation. If Christ were like us, designed to expose every sin of ours, I think none of us would dare to lift our head up in this room, right? At each other. So when someone falls, remember these things. I say again, there are some things that need to be dealt with, all right? Please don't misquote me. Number four. Now, what are some negative responses? I just want to ask this question so that we ask ourselves, have I been like that? If so, then look, I really need to change. Question number four. Some typical responses. When someone falls into sin or offends us and we don't have such love. Well, I've mentioned some of them already. We will find opportunities to jump in and expose sins, right? Right? Instead of covering a multitude of sin, 
instead of helping the brother? The negative response is, ho ho, be like the fly. Number two, take revenge. Number three, hold bitter grudge. Number four, spread, spread the details. These are just some, all right? You can think of more. But the point of asking this question is, if you and I can add more, then maybe that is what we've been doing. All right? So you go back and complete your own list. Now, question number five. So now the question is this. What is fervent charity? Because look at verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourself. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. For is the reason. If you and I have fervent charity, we will be able to achieve the covering of the multitude of sin. But what is fervent charity? What does it mean? Now, it's not just charity. We know the word charity very quite well already, all right? But the adjective added is fervent. That is the key emphasis, fervent. Now, what is this fervent? Now, fervent, this word, it means outstretched. It's like someone extending himself out of the way, outstretched. Now, it means earnest. All right? So you're here tonight, <laughs> your name. All right? We can call you fervent. <laughs> it means outstretched, earnest. This earnest and intense determination. So it is not just, well, I stretch and do something. All right? We can stretch and do something, but it is not earnest. We can be very intense, but we are not earnest. Now, this earnestness brings perseverance and genuine care. That is one of the key things. Care is one of the key meaning of this fervent. Care is involved. Caring attitude. All right? But it doesn't end there. All right? This word has the picture of enduring purpose. All right? So this stretching is stretching with, with care and, and, and earnestness, but it has an endurance to achieve a certain purpose. Now, this word is very, very rich and very beautiful. The more I try to understand it, it means, so it's not just you're just doing, 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 but that purpose, that, in, that purpose is so clear in your mind and so, so strong in your, your mind, it makes you very intense about what you're doing. Now, what is that purpose? To cover the multitude of sins, obviously. That is why it's not just about forgiveness. That is why God did not just say charity, but fervent charity. Because this charity is needed among the brethren. Now, maybe the, the reason why I ask question five, first before question six, is to help you understand the word charity, then you understand why God uses the word multitude of sins. So you already get the hint from me. All right? So you see, so God says, charity shall cover. Why not charity shall cover sins? Why not charity shall cover sins? Why not charity shall cover, why charity co shall cover the multitude of sins? Why do you think so? Right? And in James, the same. Multitude of sins. Multitude. Now, why? Why do you think so? Shilin, why do you think so? Why would you say, why would God say, you know, charity, you must have charity, and it will cover 
Why does God want to add in again a description? Multitude of sins. Why? Very good. Because it's not just one sin, two sin at that time that you're facing. God is preparing you to know that it's going to be ongoing. What does it mean? You see, as long as we live together, now this applies to the home as well, as hus between husband and wife, between parent and child, child and parent. As long as you live with another human being, you must remember we are all sinners saved by grace. It means we have multitude of sins. We are full of sins. We are constantly committing errors, whether intentional or not intentional. We must remember that it is expected to face many different kinds of offences against us. You can be charitable in one, two, three, four, ten, but when it is again and again from the same person in different kind of ways, it will wear you thin. Now, do you understand why God uses the word fervent charity? Because it needs to be enduring, persevering, stretching you to stretch yourself in the most exhausting offences against you. That's why God did not say have charity because the sins will be multitude. You need to be enduring. So understand this. Because in the home, I would say this, in the home or in the church, some of us have this unrealistic view of relationships. We have the idea that there should be no offences. There's love, right? So should not have offences, right? Well, if you live with perfect person, but there's no such person, maybe there will be no offences. We expect that there, will be, there should be no hurts, hurt feelings, hurt emotions. We have this idea that there should be no misunderstandings, no failings. It's unrealistic until we go to heaven. There are going to be many sins that you commit, I commit, that we commit against each other. There will not be just a few strains, strain, eh? strain of, there won't be just a few run-ins. There won't be just a few misunderstandings and offences. But there's going to be multitude. Now, there is this other thing that we must realise. Charity shall cover the multitude of sins. But notice how, he, how God puts it in verse 8. Charity among yourselves. Why do you think God would now add among yourselves, Wichen? Why not have charity? But why not just have charity? But God says among yourselves. Laura? Okay, then I try Laura. Very good. It's people around you first that you normally have run in some problems with, right? Among yourselves. Notice that. Because now, it is very easy to love the missionary in China, in Korea, in Myanmar, in India, in what you name it. It's very easy to love another Christian in another church. Why? Compared to the ones in your own church among ourselves. Why? 
because you don't see many, you don't see their multitude of sins. You and I see each other week in, week out. In your own homes, you see each other day in, day out. Among yourselves, it's very important to remember. It is very easy to love those whom you are not aware of their multitude of sins. You are most aware of your spouse's sins, your child's sins, your parents' sins. It's very easy to love even if you know some of their sins, but their sins don't rub against you in church. It's very easy to love them. I'm not telling you not to love them. Huh? So when God says all this, we must remember, yes, there will be multitude of problems in human relationships when we work together, live together, serve together, but That is why, all the more, we must remember the definition of fervent. Fervent. Don't give in. Don't give up. Question number seven, quickly. Why is such love important above all things? Look at verse eight. Now, after saying so many things to the Christian, look at, I asked you to read chapter four, verses one to six, right? And I hope some... 1 to 7, right? I hope some of the lessons came back to memory. How when you suffer in this world, um, um, just stay strong and how you must um, stand up for the truth and, and all that thing, right? After saying all these things. But notice this in verse 8. And above all things. Wait, hang on, Peter. You mean enduring the mockery of people? Standing up for our faith and even dying for it? Defending the truth? That is not supreme? You mean this is even above that? So I ask you the question. Why is such love important above all things? Why do you think so? Um, Alex, why do you think so? All right, number one, it is because of your testimony before the world. All right, it's good that you remember all this because constantly remember, Peter is dealing with strangers and pilgrims. That is the theme. Strangers and pilgrims is about your testimony on earth. If you don't have such love among yourselves, how are you going to bear a testimony for Christ in this world? All right? So that's a good answer. The, you, basically, Peter is saying this, or God is saying this. You can preach the best sermon to the people around you. You can defend and be pure in your practice of the truth and die for your faith. But if you cannot reflect the love of Christ in covering the multitude of sins, in showing people what it means to cover the multitude of sins, it is useless. Hence, Paul said, I can give my body to be burnt, right? 1 Corinthians. All right, I can give my body to be burnt and have not charity, it is all useless. Paul said, I can give away everything that I have. I can die for the faith. It's still useless if I have not charity. You know, it was, it is the love that they see. These Christians, we live in a world of unforgiveness. These, these, these people, they are always waiting for the chance to report one another, to kill one another so that they can climb. We live in such a world, but these Christians, or we, they live in a world that is unforgiving, selfish, self-centered, but when they see these Christians, this religion that they're trying to eradicate, well, within them, 
There is this forgiveness. There is this genuine, persevering love to help, to help each other become better. They don't hold that grudge. And even after someone has done something wicked, maybe someone has betrayed another family in weakness. They told the Roman soldiers, in weakness, well, where is that family? We want to capture them. In weakness, they say, oh, they're hiding behind that cave. Even when they were betrayed and when they asked for forgiveness, they forgive and they never hold a grudge ever again. They remember each other. They, we are all weak. We can fall into sin. When they see this kind of behavior, Paul says, above all, he's not saying that the preaching is unnecessary. He's not saying defending the truth is not necessary. He's not saying dying for the faith is not unnecessary. All he's saying is above all things. Above and above all things. All the things I told you, they are important. But without this, it is very hollow to the, to the world. That is why you hear again and again, when you invite people to church, I won't go to church. I've seen what people are like in church. I've seen what they do in church, whether it's, it's members' parents or members' children. They say that. However sound our church is, they are still not interested. They are still not interested. Why? Because of the history they remember. Hence, Peter said, above all, do you understand that Satan knows that he knows in history he cannot crush Christianity by attacking it from outside. He has known that. He has seen that. It is from inside that he has always been successful in demolishing churches. So, dear friends, if there's anything at all in your heart that you still hold grudge against, that you still would not forgive, that you are still like that fly that loves to go around and find things and then pass around, and other people have evil, evil thoughts and then cause factions and all, if any of us are still like that, you must remember that above all things, above all things, that is one thing that we need to deal with. BPCWA can be the sounders in our preaching and our teaching and even our practices, but this is what we can individually be used of Satan to destroy God's work. That's why God says, and above all things. Now, there have many, been many times when I've gone through some situations where either I get caught in the crossfire or what, and I see some mature Christians deal with things that I really learn from. In the midst of all the crossfire, and the very person that is being attacked un with unfounded allegations, the very person that is maligned and accused, yet is the very person that constantly stays very calm and have only one clear thought, this word fervent. This very clear thought. I'm stretching that no matter what, no matter how long, and no matter what you do, I'm still stretching out to you because I have a purpose. I have a purpose. Because of this word fervent, not just charity, but fervent, I have a purpose to restore this whole situation to peace, that we can quickly get back to brotherly love and do God's work together. You see, this word fervent is crucial when you are under that kind of stress. Whether it's right, whether it's wrong, is to aim to solve the problem. You can keep attacking me, but I am so concerned about you, how you will end up with God and how the other Christians will end up with God and how the whole church will be affected because I am so clear about why I want to cover the multitude of sins. It is the important above all things, above my pride, 
above my feelings, above anything else. Not above truth, huh? please. Peter is never saying above truth. So truth must still prevail, all right? Never at the expense of truth. We must still stand firm on that. But always with the same compassionate, long-suffering, stretching, extending, never exhausted aim to fulfill the restoration of peace among brethren. It is the same in the home. I put it to the home. What kind of marriage do you have? I hope this lesson will also speak to you because if you're not like that at home, you will not be like that in church. If you don't have a strong home, we will not have a strong church. I'm not just talking about husband and wife, all right? Because not, not everyone is married. I'm talking about parent and child as well. It's the same. You cannot be like that in church, but not like that at home. It's fake. So, why is it above all? Testimony. The other is the church ministries, Christian fellowship depends on it. Now, what good is there, I ask you? What good is there? The BP movement is so sound in the faith, so sound in the practice. Now, but what good is it? How long can it stand if we do not have this kind of charity? Because we will soon turn against each other, churches against churches, believers against believers. I'm not asking you to make peace with anti-VPP churches, all right? I'm not asking you to compromise. But within ourselves, what good is it if this kind of charity does not prevail? We will sooner or later for personal agendas, for unwillingness to repent when being, when being corrected, when being told for the sake of the sheep, for the sake of the congregation, please repent. We are not willing to, we are not willing to respond to conversion or we are not willing to deal with conversion, deal with helping someone to convert rightly. What good is it? We will not last very long, seriously. Be willing to be someone who is willing to go through all this. Because it's easy to give up. Why is it not just charity but fervent charity? It's easy to just walk it. Forget it. All right, forget it. I'm trying to be a peacemaker and I get sucked into all this and I get beaten up. Forget it. I'm walking away. It's easy to give up and say, forget it. Do you do that at home? Your two child quarrel, parents get involved, they're still fighting. And you try, 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 and then they get angry at you and say, ah, I give up, I'll leave you alone. You don't, because you're concerned. You're concerned about them. You know, their relationship is important. You don't give up. That is why it's, persever it's, it's non-exhausting. It's called fervent charity. But I say again, please remember, this is not just speaking to those who, who convert. Is speaking to those who are who should be converted. Love covers a multitude of sin. Means if you are unrepentant of something, you are causing problems. You are having a multitude of sins. Please respond and let it be covered. All right? So just don't keep thinking about others. Think about ourselves when we need to respond. So that is why some reasons I can Think of about why, about why it is important. Families have broken up. Churches have broken up because of this. Now, there are people who keep going around churches to churches to churches to churches to churches. Their history is they cannot stay long in one church. Very often is this. You know, very often people who come and join our church and they say a lot of nice things. I get very worried. I'm not saying that it's not good to be a church. They have the right reasons why people join. But sometimes I worry that they think that it's a perfect church because there's no such thing. And as soon as they find something that they don't like, they get very angry. So usually I say, please know this is not the perfect church. All right? You will find things that you may not like personally, You'll find that at, at times, some things may go wrong that may offend you and may be wrong that we need to change about. Please understand that, all right? To set the expectation. Now,
The last reason to question number seven is now it prevents you from poisoning. It prevents you from poisoning your family life, your church relationships. Why is it above all things? Because if you don't have this fervent charity, you will personally, with your own hands, destroy your own family. You just keep feeling that everything must be idealistic, must be your way, must be perfection. When you yourself is not perfect, you will eventually cause so much pain in everyone. And eventually, and also for the church, the same thing. You can see so much that is wrong. It's like the fly. Only zooming in. You know the flies are like that. Their nose zooms in on only the stinking wounds. The healthy parts have no attraction to their eyes or ear or nose. All right? You will just keep seeing what is wrong. Poisoning the minds of people by talking about it. But you will not see or talk about the things that are right in your home, in your church, in your spouse, in your child, in your parent. You understand what I mean by poison? Question number eight, and we close. How do you respond when you feel you cannot love as God commanded? Look at verse 8. You say, Lord, I don't know how. Have fervent charity. When God gives an instruction, it means that you can. When God gives an instruction, it means that he will help you. You pray to God for the person. You pray to God for yourself. Link it to verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand, means be concerned about Christ's things, not yours. Verse 7, be therefore sober, think clearly. Verse 7, the third thing, and watch unto prayer and above all things. And watch unto prayer and above all things. Link it. When you have problem forgiving someone, when you have problem, where you have the problem of only seeing evil about others, watch unto prayer. Pray, Lord, help me. You know, the more you pray for a person, the more you will change about the person, your attitude, your responses. Prayer has this power to change you. The person may not change, but you will change to have fervent charity. Pray. Exercise fervent charity. Exercise it. Means the word itself means effort is needed. The word fervent is not something that is spontaneous. It is not something that you naturally have. That's why I say have this. Develop this. Means develop it. Remember, fervent means extending and stretching. You don't have it, you begin to develop it, it will grow. Have fervent charity means be determined. See, God, I don't feel it. God, I'm not like that. I'm a problematic person. But now, God, I am determined not to be such a person anymore. Because everywhere I go, I seem to run into problems with people. People seem to run into problems with me. God, I am determined, determined to take action. Because you have said this is above all things. I may be sound biblically. I may be modest in my dressing. I may not listen to pop music. But Lord, I don't have this one above, this above all thing, character in me. Let us pray.
What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts, uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of, well, I take the American view, um, they're the most readily available results. They stop attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from